Hi everyone, uh, my name is Sinclair and today I'm going to be talking about the topic of drug abuse. Um, so this is uh, an extremely interesting topic to me as well as a, an extremely relevant topic to neuroscience and pharmacology in general. Um, millions of dollars has been invested in fighting addiction and drug abuse um, with mixed results. So there's still a lot more research to be done. And um, this is a topic that affects many Americans too. About 28.6 million Americans, which is about 10% of the population, are current users of illicit substances. Um, that includes marijuana, by the way. And uh, another um, 137 million Americans are uh, current users of alcohol. So it's a problem that um, many Americans deal with and has for a long time um, been attempted to have been answered by neuroscience. So I'm excited to share what I know about this topic with you guys. Okay, so first some introductory terminology. Um, the first thing I would like you guys to do is come up with your own definition of drug abuse and ask yourself, what is drug abuse? So I'll give you guys a second to pause and yeah. Okay, so I'm assuming you've paused and come up with your definition of drug abuse. So um, the definition our textbook uses um, is uh, of drug abuse is using psychoactive substances in a problematic way, usually because the substance uh, affects the mood or behavior um, in a manner that is desirable to the user. Um, so that's the definition our textbook uses, but it's also important to keep in mind that um, the words drug and the word abuse um, both have a whole range of meanings. For example, in a lot of countries, some countries, um, nicotine actually isn't considered a drug. And what is considered abuse is also um, dependent upon who you're talking to. So uh, it's a pretty general term, I will say. Some other terms to be familiar with are abuse, which is considered the early or mild phase of drug use that leads to the next more severe phase, uh, dependence. Um, and this usually is referring to physical dependency on, uh, from the substance, and it's, as I said, considered more serious than abuse. And finally, um, this leads to addiction, which usually refers to the full physical withdrawal and mental cravings that one experiences without the drug. Um, essentially, someone who's addicted can't get off the drug, um, and it's the most serious stage of drug abuse. It's also important to highlight that uh, the words abuse and dependence used to be separate kind of categories um, by the, uh, in the DSM. Um, but since the DSM-5, um, they have essentially combined the two terms into one term called a substance use disorder. Okay, so now uh, as for the organization of the lecture itself, um, we're going to start with the um, neurobiology of addiction. And this is kind of subdivided into three stages. Next, we're going to deal with the role of molecular adaptations in addiction. Um, and finally, we're going to finish with, is addiction a brain disease? So as for um, the organization of neurobiology, uh, the, the neuro neurobiology of addiction, um, we're going to start um, with convenience um, by saying that it's divided into three stages. Essentially, there is the first stage, which is preoccupation with and anticipation of obtaining and using the substance. And this is essentially cravings. Second, um, there's uh, the binge use and intoxication from substance phase, which is essentially getting high. And finally, there's withdrawal and the associated uh, negative affect that comes with that, and affect meaning essentially just mood. Um, when coming down from the drug high, that uh, further motivates uh, more use. Um, yeah, so uh, for the first stage, um, the craving stage, um, as you could put it. The prefrontal cortex is heavily implicated in this stage. Um, and as you recall from neuroscience, the prefrontal cortex is best known for its role in executive function, uh, which includes higher order cognitive abilities, such as planning, organization, problem solving, mental flexibility, and valuation of incentives. Um, but also its lesser known role is in um, regulation of emotion and motivational processing, which are important uh, for this stage as well. Um, so it's interesting that functional and structural abnormalities have been revealed in addicted subjects versus healthy ones. And this is kind of what implicated the prefrontal cortex in this stage of uh, addiction. 
And there's three kind of main glutamatergic uh, circuits um, concerned with the prefrontal cortex that we should be familiar with. First is a dorsolateral circuit. Um, this goes from the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and projects to the dorsolateral caudate nucleus and is mostly concerned with executive function. Uh, second, there's a ventromedial circuit. Um, this goes from the anterior cingulate cortex to the nucleus accumbens, and this is mainly concerned with drive and motivation. Finally, there's uh, an orbitofrontal circuit, and this goes from the orbitofrontal cortex and projects to the ventromedial caudate and is mainly concerned with behavioral inhibition and impulse control. So the first stage of the addiction cycle is associated with prefrontal cortex dysfunction. This is essentially the main takeaway of this first stage of addiction. Um, but it's also characterized by intrusive thinking, which is kind of referring to a uh, persistent uncontrollable thought or uh, persistent and uncontrollable thoughts about using the drug again, um, which next leads to cravings, which is a strong motivation to act on these intrusive thoughts. And finally, you have failure of impulse control where the person finally gives in. Um, and each of these are kind of associated with a neurobiological mechanism behind it. So for intrusive thinking, it's associated with abnormal activity within pathways from the prefrontal cortex, amygdala, and hippocampus to the ventral striatum. And interestingly, this is um, the same mechanism with OCD intrusive thoughts or intrusive thoughts and other disorders. It's all the same mechanism, um, which is interesting. And the mechanism behind craving is associated with activation of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, orbitofrontal cortex, uh, anterior cingulate cortex, dorsal and ventral striata, and the insula. And as you remember from neuroscience, um, the insula is very involved with interoception. And essentially how it's involved in the um, this craving is uh, pr essentially interoceptive or drug-induced interoceptive stimuli is relayed from the thalamus to the insula, um, where the insula mediates this interoceptive information and projects to the amygdala and the uh, and the VMP uh, PFC, which transform this interoceptive signal signaling to pleasure and liking. Um, and um, as you can see, dopamine um, from the ventral tegmental area also as a result of taking drugs, also modulates um, these projections. Um, and finally, we have um, two major um, sort of mechanisms for failure of impulse control. The first of which is the transition from a ventral striatum, particularly the nucleus accumbens, uh, to the dorsal striatum as a key control area for drug taking behavior. Um, and second, we have a blunting of striatal dopamine transmission, which has been linked to increased impulsivity. And this kind of touches on what our article discussion will actually um, talk about. So I'm not gonna go too much into this right now, but we'll get into that for the article discussion. So ultimate takeaways from stage one. Um, there's two opposing behavioral control systems going on here. There's the go system and the stop system. Um, and addiction actually invokes enhancement of the GO system. This was actually demonstrated in 2013 by Chen et al, who essentially um, got these cocaines or the, these rats addicted to cocaine and <laughs> taught them to self-administer it. Um, and they then tested how much electro shocks they would withstand in order to keep getting this cocaine. And they found that in rats that withstood more electro shocks, um, they had diminished prefrontal cortex activity. Um, so that was pretty interesting. And um, finally, one other thought is that the development and maturation of the prefrontal cortex occurs primarily during adolescence and is fully accomplished at the age of 25 years. And it's very important, as we know, for executive function and behavioral performance. Um, and it's just kind of interesting to think about how this drug use really alters the function and structure of the prefrontal cortex and just how this could interact with a developing prefrontal cortex um, 
I'm sure there have been studies on it um, looking at that, but that's definitely an interesting thought right there. So the second stage is uh, binge use and intoxication from substance, essentially getting high. And for this, we're gonna do some drawing. So I will see you guys there in a second. Okay, so the main neurobiological mechanism underlying uh, the getting high uh, phase of addiction has to do with something called the reward circuit. And the reward circuit is involved with pathways we've learned before, um, such as the mesocortical pathway, from the VTA to the frontal cortex, as well as um, the mesolimbic pathway from the VTA to the nucleus accumbens. Um, the next system we're, uh, we'll talk about is called the extended amygdala model. Um, and it essentially starts from the amygdala with projections from um, the amygdala um, to the uh, bed nucleus of the stria terminalis. Um, and then we also have projections from bed nucleus of the stria terminalis to nucleus accumbens. And we also have projections from the nucleus accumbens to the back to the amygdala. So now we can start talking a little bit about how specific drugs act in, on this reward system. And different drugs essentially get their different effects from how, where, or how they interact with this reward circuit. Um, so to start with stimulants, um, for example. Um, stimulants act directly on this pathway from the VTA to the nucleus accumbens, the mesolimbic pathway, um, specifically increasing synaptic dopamine um, through either making the uh, presynaptic cell produce more dopamine or blocking reuptake of dopamine, or both. So that is for stimulants. Next we can cover um, opioids. So opioids get their effects uh, through stimulating opioid receptors and endogenous opioid peptides. So there's opioid receptors located on the VTA, the amygdala, as well as the nucleus accumbens. Uh, next, we can move on to alcohol. Uh, alcohol gets its effects by enhancing uh, the action of GABA on GABA-A receptors. So there are GABA-A receptors on the VTA, the uh, amygdala, and the nucleus accumbens. And this in turn uh, increases dopamine on, uh, in the uh, nucleus accumbens as well as, um, as, well as uh, releases opioid peptides um, from uh, the reticular pontine nucleus to uh, uh, to opioid receptors on the VTA, and um, as well as the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus to the nucleus accumbens, and finally the frontal cortex to opioid receptors on the nucleus accumbens. Um, next, we can talk about nicotine and THC, which have very similar, or not similar effects, but act kind of in a similar way. They act on separate receptors, nicotine acting on nicotinic receptors as an agonist, and THC um, reacting with uh, cannabinoid receptors and binding to cannabinoid receptors. Um, but they're both in the same locations. So for nicotinic receptors, they're located on the VTA, the amygdala, and the nucleus accumbens. And it's the same thing for cannabinoids on the nucleus accumbens, the amygdala, as well as the VTA. Um, and essentially these both uh, enhance dopamine release on um, the nucleus accumbens through either local mechanisms or direct interaction with the VTA. Um, yeah, so that's it for the drawing. So now we're, we'll go back to the presentation. Okay, we're back to the presentation. So. This is pretty much an overview of what we just drew. So I won't spend any more time on this. Um, and just kind of giving a closer examination to these molecular targets of different drugs acting on in different parts of the reward circuit. 
uh, this image does a pretty good job. Um, we can see stimulants acting directly on dopamine release to the nucleus accumbens, cannabinoid receptors binding directly to the nucleus accumbens. Um, we can see, oh, here's one PCP we didn't talk about. That is actually an NMDA antagonist. So it blocks um, the NMDA channel by binding to the PCP site. Um, alcohol, opioids, um, these opioid peptide chan or pathways we talked about. And yeah. And we can see that alcohol is also related to these opioid peptides. So yeah, pretty much just another way of looking at what we just drew out. Okay, next is something called incentive sensitization theory. <laughs> that was hard uh, for some reason, but um, this was essentially proposed by um, Robinson and Barrage in 1993. And it introduced a uh, drug liking, which is kind of the high feeling you get system uh, versus a drug craving or like wanting system. And the, incent, uh, the term incentive salience had a big role in this too. And this was specifically referring to the psychological process leading to this wanting system. Um, and essentially what they found was that, or what they hypothesized was that um, wanting uh, in general is increased as addiction goes on while liking is decreased. Um, and this is thought to occur be, due to sensitization of the wanting system, but for some reason not the liking system. And a little way of looking at this is right here, as you can see after this is time and this is the relative effect. Um, wanting generally goes up while liking at a lower rate goes down. And this is kind of the opposite of common sense of what you would expect, but is one of the interesting ways that addiction can mess with our um, neurobiology. And it was also found that catecholamine depletion um, was found to reduce cocaine wanting while having no effect on liking. So um, this is actually could be a new target for um, drug addiction or uh, drugs targeting addiction um, because oftentimes what you have a problem with for addiction drugs is um, you may be able to lower how much someone wants a drug, but you'll also, or how effective it is, but you'll also affect their receptiveness to natural endogenous uh, neurotransmitters. So this is an interesting way of how wanting was decreased, but liking stayed the same. So um, the endogenous neurotransmitters were relatively unaffected, which is really awesome. So stage three, the final stage, uh, is withdrawal and the associative negative affect when coming down from the high that motivates further use. So the primary mechanism of stage three is neuroadaptation, which is defined as persistent neurological changes that can encompass neurotransmitter activity, gene expression, cellular structure, and neural circuitry. Um, and there were kind of two primary types of neuroadaptations opposed, uh, proposed. Uh, first, a within system neuroadaptation, which was associated with the, something called the reward system, which we just covered. And second, a between systems neuroadaptation, which is associated with the anti reward system. Um, and the anti reward system is just the extended amygdala system that we just covered in blue, in Drew. That is the anti-reward system. Um, and there are some crucial differences between the anti-reward system and the reward system. Uh, primarily, first of all, that the reward system uses dopamine, whereas the anti-reward system uses norepinephrine and uh, two cortico or two um, uh, two neuropeptides, one called corticotropin releasing factor, which is called CRF, and the other being dynorphin. And essentially the anti-reward system's main purpose is to act as a break on reward. Um, think of it as a backup mechanism just in case we had unlimited food and unlimited things that make us feel good. It's a break to make sure we don't get a little too sucked into that. Um, and importantly, it's activated during withdrawal and acts as a negative reinforcement, um, causing one to wanna use drugs again. <laughs> 
And um, interestingly, it's also stronger. The Andrew Wood system is stronger for drugs that have a stronger physical dependence as well. So the stronger the physical dependence of the drug, the more it's going to act on this anti-reward system. Um, and this kind of led to a modern take on something called the opponent process model. Um, and essentially what the opponent process model is, is um, it's essentially saying that when, um, or, or um, affective emotions are organized in such a way that when you have one very strong affective emotion, um, you're going to essentially trigger another opposite affective emotion. And a good example of this is skydiving. So if you think about when you go skydiving, you're really scared before and nervous and anxious. And then when you finally get back to the ground, you have this rush of, uh, like relief, I guess. And that is a good example of the anxiety and the relief uh, opposing affective emotions. And essentially, um, this reward and anti-reward systems were uh, proposed to be essentially an updated opponent process model for addiction. Um, and the, and Kub and Lamol um, hypothesized that uh, a process called allostasis gradually changes the baseline uh, hedonic state, which is mood, um, and this process, allostasis, is essentially the process by which a biological variable, um, it could be psychological or biological, um, but um, some sort of biological variable is uh, repeatedly challenged and changes its set point in order to maintain stability. Um, so to clear that up a little bit, um, we can look at this chart in the bottom right. Um, it essentially shows a non-dependent drug user on the left and shows that as they use the drug at first, their mood is increased. And then as they come off the drug, it slowly decreases until it's slowly below baseline, but returns to baseline pretty fast. This is um, contrasting a dependent user who essentially because of their drug use, um, their baseline state has shifted down lower because they're so used to having the drug in their system that their system wants to be here. So it's essentially compensating for the drug to be here. Um, but when that means when the person's not on the drug, they're going to start at a lower baseline and then use that drug to get up to their baseline. But then what ends up happening is they crash even further below their baseline or their lower baseline. Um, which really causes um, severe negative mood and kind of strengthens uh, the motivation to take the drug again. But as you can see, they eventually do return to their lower baseline state, but that's still lower than their original state. So they still feel pretty bad here. Um, yeah, so this was a really interesting theory. Next, um, I'm gonna kind of highlight the role of molecular adaptations in addiction. <clears throat> so every time you take a drug, uh, something called delta Fos B is uh, kind of accumulates in your system. And the more you use the drug, more of it will accumulate. But it's a transcription factor, which as we can recall from molecular biology, um, is a protein that stimulates or inhibits the expression of a target gene, having the effect of up or down regulating the protein produced by that gene. Um, so ultimately this accumulation of uh, uh, delta Fos B changes behavior. Um, and in mice it specifically makes them more sensitive to drug effects, except interestingly morphine induced analgesia, which is, which is interesting to me. Um, but essentially this transcription factor changes behavior through modulation of gene expression through epigenetic mechanisms. Um, and as you can recall epi, uh, from molecular biology as well, an epigenetic mechanism is a change in DNA structure of the chromatin, but not actually of the nucleotide sequence. So it's structurally changing the shape of the chromatin to express or repress genes. And this is a picture of how this kind of works and <clears throat> how genes are activated by um, delta Fos B is through acetylation, which um, essentially facilitates gene expression through opening the chromatin and um, allowing um, a transcriptional machinery to build DNA. 
And this is opposed to methylation, which is um, the main mechanism for uh, repressing a gene through epigenetic mechanisms. <clears throat> and this essentially works by promoting uh, the compaction of chromatin, which represses gene expression. And it's important to note that uh, delta FOS B does both of these epigenetic um, mechanisms. So, yeah. And it's also, um, this first of all provides kind of a good example of how addiction over the long term can work, but also um, could be a mechanism for how antidepressant drugs or schizophrenic drugs that um, take a while to take effect, um, that could be how they work as well. Or this could be. Um, next, there are a couple of additional epigenetic mechanisms that play a role here um, that aren't related to delta FOSB. And these are kind of predisposing factors a little bit. They're things that happen to you before you would have even taken a drug that influence your susceptibility to taking a drug and addiction. Um, so yeah, these pretty much promote initial drug seeking and drug use. So the first of these is childhood maltreatment or other stressful events. This has been shown um, to increase your likelihood of substance abuse later in life and is thought to occur through epigenetic uh, through an epigenetic mechanism due to stress. Uh, the second of these is parental drug exposure before mating. This one I find really cool. Um, pretty, for example, um, let's say a father takes cocaine um, before he's had children and uh, through the delta FOS B mechanism we just discussed, an epigenetic change happens. And this also happens in the germline, which give rise to sperm. So essentially these sperm are going to have these epigenetic changes due to cocaine and delta FOS B, um, which the father can actually pass down to his children. So this is a way that drug experiences can be passed down uh, generationally, which is very cool to me. Um, and so how this is kind of put together um, is that these uh, inherited pr uh, predispositions, which could be the parental drug exposure, for example, or environmental stimuli, such as childhood maltreatment, increase one's chances of acute drug exposure. And once acute drug exposure happens, you're having more epigenetic changes, um, that DNA methylation and histone modifications, which is the acetylation that we were talking about earlier. Um, and this will further modify gene expression, which further influences the person's susceptibility to addictive disorders, which makes them repeat drug exposure again, which causes more epigenetic changes, which modifies more genes, and you get it. Um, and also, this repeat drug exposure can lead to addiction and relapse, too. So it really is a vicious cycle that gets worse and worse, um, because ultimately, the more epigenetic changes one has, um, the more susceptible they are to addiction. Um, also, it is important to note that this research has primarily been done in mice. Um, a lot more research has to be done for humans, um, as opposed to the reward circuit, which was also done in mice. That has a more clear connection to humans, but th these epigenetic mechanisms have not been demonstrated that much in humans, if at all. So that's very important to note. <clears throat> so finally, we will get to the question of, is addiction a disease? Um, this is actually a question that has gone out on throughout the history of drugs. And um, pretty much there's two opposing viewpoints here. Uh, but what I want you to do first is take a moment to evaluate your own thoughts. Is addiction a disease or a choice? Um, just try to identify like where your beliefs kind of stand here. Even if you haven't thought about this question, you probably have a natural inclination towards one or the other. Um, so take a second to do that. And yeah. Okay, so I'm assuming you've written down um, your thoughts on whether addiction is a disease or a choice. So here are the two th main theories or uh, schools of thought, I guess. So the most widely recognized model is the disease model. It's also known as the medical model, and this is because it is endorsed by the vast majority of people who study uh, the neurobiological mechanisms and molecular mechanisms of addiction. And it's also, um, it's also induced by the WHO as well as the National Institute of Drug Abuse on Drug Abuse. Um, 
So overall, this is the more uh, popular in the scientific community. Um, and it's also based on this idea that we talked earlier that repeated drug exposure causes dysregulation of brain function and addiction. And this is pretty undisputed at this point that drug expo repeat drug exposure causes dysregulation of brain function and addiction. So there's pretty strong evidence there, but there's also the moral model of addiction. And this has been probably for most of history more popular um, because mostly because the addiction or the, sorry, the disease model is newer. Um, but essentially for most of history, the drug abuse has been seen as a choice and a sign of personal weakness. Um, and so, but there are a few criticisms, valid criticisms of each, and I'll get into those right now. So the criticisms of the disease model first are that the fact that repeated drug exposure alters the brain, um, technically doesn't prove addiction is a disease. People who say this argue that every experience you have alters your brain in some way, often permanently. So just having that doesn't exactly make addiction a brain disease. Um, next criticism of the disease model is that there's technically no single di diagnostic test to confirm someone is addicted to a drug. Um, um, if you kind of um, compare this to other brain diseases such as Alzheimer's or um, Parkinson's or ALS, they have more uh, set standards for what is considered um, having that disease. While drug addiction is um, a lot more subjective, I would say. Um, the DSM-5 actually, um, under substance use disorder, all of the criteria are actually um, behavioral sim they're symptoms, essentially. So there's no actual test. It's all just behavioral symptomology, um, so which is a criticism of the disease model. Um, and also, some argue that um, addicts turn to drugs to alleviate emotional pain, as other healthy reinforcers fail to provide enough motivation to be chosen over the drug. I think this um, definitely sounds like a valid criticism. Um, and actually has been shown to um, in in practice somewhat with something called contingency management, and this is essentially a, a program that you you would sign up for, um, and you would agree to have weekly or monthly or however long you agree um, drug tests or urine tests, and in exchange for testing positive for those tests, you get uh, vouchers like inexpensive gifts or access to housing possibly. Um, just some other reward that isn't the drug. And the idea of this is just to give people healthier reinforcing mechanisms than drugs. Um, and so there's definitely, I think, a lot of um, uh, basis and uh, a lot to learn that could be learned from that. And the final criticism of this um, is rat, something called Rat Park. And Rat Park, the lesson that we kind of have learned from Rat Park is a lesson that we have seen time and time again um, in neuroscience and in this class, um, which is focusing too much on the central nervous system and not enough on the person as a whole. Um, so essentially, uh, Rat Park was a series of experiments in the 1970s by a man named Bruce K. Alexander. And before this research was done, the most drug addiction research was done uh, on rats was done using something called a Skinner box. And um, BF Skinner um, is associated with it, uh, operant conditioning, if you remember from psychology. But um, pretty much Alexander argued that these conditions are really just scary for a very social creature like a rat and and that essentially by putting them in this terrible environment you're making them want to do drugs because they they're not having fun in there so what alexander did was build this giant rat park as he called it with filled with toys and other rats and just a really nice place for rats to live honestly a place where they could really be happy and they could study the effects of drugs on actual happy mice um, and they essentially put two water spouts in there, one that contained uh, morphine-laced water and the other that was just plain water. And it was very interesting that the rats compared to the uh, Skinner box subjects showed a um, 
preference for the water without morphine can, uh, at a rate that was something like 16 times as low or something. They still did drink the morphine water from time to time, but more in a way that a human would recreationally use a substance from time to time, not necessarily in an addictive manner, um, which was really interesting. Um, also, I just want to point out this experiment has been in the media somewhat, um, and some in the media have incorrectly tried to say that this experiment kind of proved that addiction is a social is socially caused and not really a neurobiological mechanism. And this is just completely not true. Um, that's just completely people misinterpreting the study. Um, even Alexander did not say this. Um, but yeah, like I said, this is a downfall of neuro or neuroscience, in my opinion, even though neuroscience has helped us tremendously in understanding addiction and so many other things, sometimes we can get too focused on just the brain and not the rat. Um, and, um, but yeah, essentially, like I said at the beginning of the video, millions of dollars have been spent on targeting or studying the brain's role in addiction. And um, studies like this are good at reminding us that it's not all about the brain all the time. Um, so next, um, we're gonna deal with criticisms of the moral model. Um, so, for the major criticism of the moral model, or a major criticism of the moral model, is that regarding addiction as a moral weakness has been shown to have negative effects on addicts themselves and their recovery. Now, we primarily want to help addicts, so promoting a viewpoint that is destructive to their um, destructive to their recovery doesn't exactly seem the best way to go about it. But um, yeah, it's definitely a very good point that. Um, and that this is one of the reasons that many addicts themselves prescribe to the disease model. Um, also, uh, considering addiction as a disease helps provide health insurance coverage for addiction treatment. Um, this is kind of uh, undisputed. A lot of drug companies won't accept, or insurance companies, uh, or a lot of people can't get um, on maintenance programs, for example without uh, insurance or, uh, and also Medicaid does not cover this a lot of the times. Uh, Medicaid and Medicare usually only cover maintenance medications if their use is deemed vital for the ongoing health of the individual. And it's pretty hard to be vital um, by their standards usually. And this is just another interesting statistic. Um, and it shows that the price of incarceration is twice the amount of punishment. And I just thought that was interesting that, you know, um, treatment obviously helps people more than jail. So I guess we really are focused on punishing people instead of trying to help them a lot of the times. And finally, my biggest problem with the moral theory personally is what is considered moral? It's, it's entirely unclear and changes constantly um, and is often political. So this can be seen in government policy and in one way that tobacco and alcohol treatment um, or people who want alcohol and tobacco treatment uh, don't need to fear any prosecution when trying to find help. However, if you use an illegal drug, um, you're often sent to jail instead of treatment. And um, this kind of, in a way, is the government in a way saying that alcohol and tobacco are more moral, I guess, than illegal drugs, um, which kind of, um, but well, I mean, also the government is not consistent with their policy and I'll talk about this more, but also another example is uh, the policy differences between crack and cocaine. Um, uh, pharmacologically, there is very little difference between these two drugs. Pretty much the main difference between these two drugs is the socioeconomic status of the people who tend to use them, the race of the people who tend to use them, and just the general groups of people who tend to use them. And essentially, when you're making policy decision uh, about two different drugs using those factors, um, you know, it just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, and I'm sure it doesn't make a lot of sense to many of you. Um, so, this can also be seen in society too. It's not just the government, but um, for example, alcohol is one of the most socially acceptable drugs. 
except it's also one of the most dangerous and unhealthy. So it's clear that society and government actually doesn't use the how bad a drug is for you in declaring how immoral it is.